Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our seminar this morning. My name is Alison Rose. I'm Chief of Place, Space and Communities Division at Geoscience Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and to pass my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people who are participating and joining us in our seminar today. This morning's seminar is Treading Lightly, How Geoscience is Revealing Human Impacts in Antarctica, and the presenter is Dr. Steph McLennan. Antarctica conjures up images of expansive white ice sheets, but what about the 1% not covered by ice? Those small, these exposed islands of rocks are hotspots of human and animal activity, Tourism, infrastructure development and research activities can harm these fragile environments and in the dry Antarctic climate, damage from walking and vehicle tracks can actually persist for years. Geoscience Australia's landscape, landscape vulnerability project has been addressing knowledge gaps about how these environments react to disturbance by people, how they recover and new methods to track landscape change. Through this work, GA is helping to build Australia's capability as a leader in Antarctic environmental stewardship and meet our obligations under the Antarctic Treaty System and domestic legislation. Now a little bit about our presenter. Doc Dr. Steph McLennan is a geologist working to understand how ice-free land in Antarctica is vulnerable to human impacts, how fragile landscape nat naturally recovers, and ways we can prevent and rehabilitate disturbance. She joined Geoscience Australia as a graduate and was awarded her PhD in Geochemistry and Sedimentology from University of Adelaide in 2016. She is the Chief Investigator on a five-year research project with the Australian Antarctic Science Program and a Partner Investigator on the ARC Special Research Initiative, Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. Steph is a 2019-20 Superstar of STEM and a 2021 Young Tall Poppy Award winner. So with that, I'll hand over to you, Steph. Thanks, Ali, and, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Before I get started, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I'm joining you today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and celebrate their continuing connection to lands, waters and community. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about um, some research that Geoscience Australia has been leading in Antarctica over the last few years. Um, to understand the direct human impact on ice-free environments. I'll talk about and outline why this work's important, um, give you a couple of highlights and results, and then finish up with a couple of questions and, and next steps that I think we need to take. And I think this work can best be summarised here by the fact that for the last four years, I have been obsessed with footprints. And though my focus is obviously on, on Antarctica, once you get an eye in for it, you start seeing the impact of foot traffic everywhere. Closer to home, um, this is Mount Ainsley, um, just in the inner north of Canberra, a really popular walking track. And this track here runs up the ridge uh, of Mount Ainsley, and it was originally cleared for power lines, but now it's kept clear by a lot of pedestrian traffic, especially during lockdown. And the impacts of that you know, continual foot traffic um, are really quite stark here. You can see that there's obviously a colour contrast um, and changes in grain size as well. So really fine material bull dust is brought to the surface um, where it can easily be blown away by the wind or, or washed away in heavy downpours. Um, sort of larger material, gravel and, and cobbles are kind of moved to the side um, as, we, as we stomp through that area. Leaf litter and organic debris is moved about and moved to the sides and that's removing that organic source um, at the top of the soil there. Soils compacted um, and that changes infiltration and nutrient cycling as well. And so we get a lot of runoff um, in downpours, um, rutting as well. And, you know, these sorts of disturbances become kind of self-sustaining. Tracks like this can also tend to widen a lot over time 
Um, this one stayed fairly consistent and there's a good incentive for that at Mount Ainsley. There's a field of unexploded ordnance um, off to the east, but elsewhere there's less incentive um, to stay to, to stick to the tracks. And our laziness starts to kick in. Um, we love the path of least resistance. And so this is a style, there's several of these that were installed on the track um, to discourage cyclists from using the path. We can see that even when we're setting out to do a four kilometer hike, we like to detour around um, and form a track completely off the bitumen um, to avoid that small inconvenience in the middle there. And when remediation takes place, it's not as simple as just pulling that up um, and you know everything going back to normal really quickly. So these styles have actually been removed in a few locations, probably in the last six months or so. Um, and on the right of this um, second image, you can see that detour track um, is still there. It's been, you know, its use is discouraged by having branches over it, but we're still seeing that soil compression. There's even a little gully here that started to form from runoff. Um, you know, that, um, you know, that, that impact is going to be really difficult for nature to sort of, you know, naturally recover. Um, other efforts to remediate uh, closed tracks can be quite significant. So this is Black Mountain, another really popular walking track in Canberra. Um, this is a closed track near the summit. And there's some fairly significant actions that have happened here uh, to rehabilitate this track. Obviously, we've got those artificial burns in place to prevent runoff, to help build up of material. Um, organic uh, material has been deliberately moved in um, onto the track to help rebuild that organic layer got revegetation efforts um, with those sleeves there protecting seedlings, signage um, and things like that. And these efforts um, and these things introduced won't necessarily be permanent, but they will be there for many years. So what has all of this got to do with Antarctica? The environment that you can hike over in Antarctica is obviously pretty different to Mount Ainsley, Black Mountain. Um, there's a lot less traffic as well. The impacts are more subtle, but they are still there particularly in, in some really fragile spots. So footprints, even a single set, can leave a significant mark on parts of the landscape. These are examples of boot prints, um, single boot prints from a place called Marine Plain, and I'll tell you a bit more about Marine Plain later on. The surface with the cobbles and, and gravel looks quite solid, but once you crack through that really thin surface crust, you can see on the right there, um, that's from me walking through here uh, last year, you know, I'm up to my ankles. Um, sinking into this incredibly fine powdery dust. Um, when we visited um, this spot last year um, in 2019-20 summer, we also took some drone imagery. That was principally to capture some fossil sites um, that we wanted to look at, but what it also showed were footprints that weren't ours um, from our visit. They're really difficult um, to spot in these sort of grey um, kind of imagery. They almost look like a sheep track uh, through a paddock. You might be able to just make them out there um, coming up diagonally through the screen. And after some head scratching and some investigation and digging, we realised that these likely came from a visit um, from a group that went in here two years previous to us. Um, these boot prints, these footprints we were capturing from a small drone 50 metres in the air. They were so crisp we could see which direction they were walking in because you could see where the front of the boot flared out. Um, we could see where this party of three had sometimes followed in their um, each other's footsteps and then also bifurcated their trails as well. And that's still there um, sitting at the surface years later. The impacts of foot traffic can compound over time and become permanent fixtures um, on different substrates as well. So this is uh, from Scott Bay. Base, one of the New Zealand station or the New Zealand station um, over near McMurdo. Um, this trail, you can see it trailing up the tracking up the hillside there, and there's someone um, in the far distance walking down. And although this is quite different to what we saw in Marine Plain, it's not that really powdery fine stuff, we can still see that larger material is getting moved to the side. We're forming a bit of a rut um, in that in that material. And as well in these um, permafrost environments, when you're pressing the soil and, and changing um, it's, it's profile at the surface, you can bring on melting of the permafrost. And that grey crust that you can see at the surface is actually salt. As ice underneath the surface has melted, it's brought water into the um, subsurface, it's mobilised salts um, in the soil. They've been drawn to the surface where it's evaporated um, and dried out. 
And so we can see that there are different kinds of impacts um, and we need different approaches for managing these impacts re and rehabilitating areas that might be damaged. And that requires behind it a really good understanding of those different landscapes, what they're made of, the geological processes that form them. But these are just, you know, half a dozen footprints and, you know, one trail from one station um, on an enormous continent. You know, Antarctica is at the ends of the earth. Um, it's a, there's a tiny fraction of its land exposed. Meanwhile, there's ice shelves collapsing, the ocean is acidifying, um, there's huge questions about Antarctica's role in sea level rise and its role in the global climate system. And so with all of that, you know, I think it's fair to ask, like, why would we care about a couple of footprints uh, and some walking tracks? These ice-free environments, like I said, are rare. Um, they're mapped in brown here. Um, it's about 54,000 square kilometres all up. And to put that into context, that would be like having half of Tasmania exposed and the rest of Tassie and all of the Australian mainland completely covered in ice. But these ice-free areas are hot real estate. There's lots of a lot of activity. Um, these are stations, so year-round stations um, and also seasonal stations. Um, particularly on the Antarctic Peninsula, we have a lot of tourism in ice-free areas. It's estimated that half of the coastal ice-free areas in Antarctica have some kind of human impact on them. And three quarters of the buildings in Antarctica um, actually are in ice-free areas. So they're really um, disproportionately impacted and, and there's a lot of presence in these areas despite their small size. They're pretty easy to access. There's also a lot of wildlife um, and biodiversity in these ice-free areas, which makes them great scientific studies as well. And geologically, they're some of our best windows into the past. And so there's a lot of need for scientists to be in these locations as well, but also potential for a lot of disturbance. Our focus has been um, the Vestfold Hills in East Antarctica, and it's the location of Australia's Davis Station. This area is about half the size of Canberra, um, suburban Canberra, not even the ACT. It's only about 400 square kilometres in size, and yet it's the third largest ice-free area in Antarctica. And footprints can have far-reaching consequences. Further than a station um, certainly could go, or vehicle tracks, we wouldn't think twice necessarily about walking through areas, um, but we wouldn't necessarily build a station um, or put in a track in all areas as well. And, and like I said, you know, in this cold, dry Antarctic environment, disturbances can, um, and impacts can last for years. In the McMurdo Dry Valleys um, on the other side of Antarctica, there are campsites from the 1980s that are still visible. You can see tracks uh, that people made between tents. There's also policy drivers for why we're addressing these sorts of issues. So Antarctica is governed by the Antarctic Treaty System, of which Australia is an original signatory. And one of its instruments is the Madrid Protocol. It's probably most famous for its ban on mining activities, um, but what the Madrid Protocol also sets out is the principles that need to be considered when it comes to environmental impact assessments in Antarctica. So all in activities in Antarctica are subject to some kind of environmental assessment. Um, and the Madrid Protocol really sets out what needs to be considered um, when we're talking about impact and environmental disturbance. I won't read out the whole protocol, um, but I'll I'll paraphrase a couple of my favourite bits. So the Madrid Protocol um, beautifully designates Antarctica as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science, which I think is just one of the best lines ever. Um, but it also sets out that activities shall avoid adverse impacts on areas of biological, scientific, historic, aesthetic or wilderness significance. And I think what's interesting here is that biological and scientific values are essentially given, you know, the same weight as aesthetics um, and the wilderness values of Antarctica. Activities shall be planned with informed judgment about their possible impacts and cumulative impacts. So not just an activity in isolation, but what it means over time and in relation to other impacts. And regular and effective monitoring shall facilitate early detection of unforeseen effects. And I think when it comes to this work that we've been doing, um, what this means to me is where we have knowledge gaps, we might be failing to adequately protect the environment and we can't protect what we don't understand. So with the support of the Australian Antarctic Science Program, um, GA's had a project um, looking at human impacts in Antarctica over the last few years. And there's three, um, I guess, key areas that we've been focusing on. Fundamental information about the physical environment and its characteristics, 
putting in some test sites to look at how the environment naturally tries to rehabilitate itself over time and how it changes, uh, and also trial some monitoring techniques. And the focus with those monitoring techniques was doing things in a light touch way. Um, so we only had a field team of two um, and you know, trialing techniques that could be done by non-experts um, in the future so that we didn't necessarily need to have GA staff on the ground, but anyone who had access to an area might be able to do some kind of monitoring for us. So one of the reasons we chose Davis uh, was because it's pretty accessible, has a long history of human impacts and planned future activities. There's also a lot of um, existing data that was useful um, as, as background information. So this is a subset of an aerial photo. We had about 300 gigabytes of aerial photos. Um, and at first glance, you know, you can see some lakes here um, and this you know, bedrock dominated environment. Um, and it's cross cut by these, these dark lines, these um, dolerite dikes um, that are billions of years old, uh, many, many millions of years old and are really quite a striking feature of this environment. And a lot of past work has gone into understanding that bedrock evolution. Um, but really what we're interested in is what sits at the surface, what's sort of just over the top of that. We had satellite imagery um, and also a great digital elevation model. We still lacked a lot of systematic information like thematic maps. Um, this map here on the left is the only published geological map of the Westfold Hills and only covers a quarter um, of the area. Um, and it's focus is the bedrock geology and we're focused really on on what's on the top of that because that's what's going to be largely impacted by human activities um, on the right as well as um, an example from earlier studies uh, on the geomorphology and, and landscape evolution and geological history of the area um, and these are sort of these are really valuable um, studies with great observations but they um, you know the it's a scratchy sort of figure one from a paper from the 1980s um, and even to the early 1990s. So um, really sort of difficult to get um, a lot of good information out of those. Um, and again, you know, satellite imagery, um, aerial photography was, was really valuable, but it was surprising that um, probably a third of the places that we went to, uh, at least, it was, you know, we we're looking at things that we didn't quite expect, um, that we didn't gather from the interpretation um, you know, remotely uh, before going in. So we started with the basics, um, mapping the geological materials at the surface. Um, and that involved, as all good geologists, you know, enjoy um, looking at rocks that we wanted to take home, hugging rocks, um, you know, lots of licking, well, not lots of licking rocks, but licking some rocks, um, getting a really close up view of things. And I, this was really to get it, uh, to start cataloging features at the surface um, in a really systematic way. There'd been studies of sort of almost postage stamp size um, things in the past, but we wanted to get a sense of what was going across the whole area. So we've just published, um, this has just come out in the last couple of weeks, the Sufficial Geology of the Bestfold Hills um, map. It was at one to 2000 scale. Um, and this map um, is, a, is a flat PDF map um, and the underlying geodatabase is on its way as well. Not surprisingly, we didn't really have a mapping scheme in Australia um, that, was, that suited this application. And so we borrowed a scheme from the Canadian Geological Survey um, and that thoroughly describes sufficient materials, things that we would have in mainland Australia, like river and wind deposits, um, but with a really great way of explaining um, and picking apart different glacial deposits, which is perfect for Antarctica, of course. I'll highlight a couple of the um, sort of typical features and more interesting features that we found as well. So this is a pretty typical view um, that you might find in the Vestfold Hills. Um, and on the right is sort of um, just a sketch of how we might break that um, and split that environment up into its different parts. And so in the background, um, you can see a, a bedrock hill and over the top of it, it's got a really thin layer of glacial material over the top, which we call a till veneer. Um, in the valley and on the plains, you know, there's hundreds of lakes through this area. And what's interesting about the lakes is that they'll expand and contract over time, depending on how much water input they have. What that means in terms of vulnerability is that you can see it mapped in, in that sort of dark ring around the lake is that these areas, um, they sort of get sorted a bit and winnowed, mud gets drawn to the surface, 
um, gets can dries out, gets blown away um, during blizzards and um, in high wind events. And in summer, when things start to melt out, it becomes incredibly boggy. So if you're thinking of putting in um, tracks um, or you know transport routes or anything, um, you'd certainly want to know you know areas like this that might be really hard to rehabilitate or where you might get stuck. Uh, and this feature in the centre here is, um, is a sort of a hummock. Um, these smooth uh, features up to about 30 or 50 metres high are actually standing on one in the foreground here. Um, these are important from a scientific standpoint. We think they represent points at which when the ice sheet was last retreating, um, that it was had an accumulation build up of material at its surface. It was perhaps stagnant here for a while and just shedding this material off. We see them concentrated um, in quite a large band in one area, but then there are random occurrences of it elsewhere in the hills. And so trying to understand um, you know, what that means uh, you know, in terms of past ice sheet behaviour. And it's really just a starting point to flag where these things are, um, and then they can be followed up with more detailed field investigations. As I mentioned, lakes are really important. Some of them are uh, really salty, uh, former marine inlets, um, isolated um, seawater. Um, and around a lot of them, we have this terrace um, or bench feature. You can just see it um, marked there. And these are really interesting. Um, they're quite striking features. They're very popular walking routes because they're nice, relatively flat and easy to navigate. Um, what's interesting about them though, is that they're also full of fossil shells um, called Laternula, um, and there's also sponge spicules and worm tubes and things like that. And they're papery thin um, and really easy to damage. And I think it's really important that we clearly map out where these features are so that we can make recommendations about how to minimise impacts with, you know, walking and, and camping and things like that. We've known about them for a really long time um, and they've been dated as well in the past. Um, but I think, you know, there's future scientific value that these might hold that we can't recognise or realise yet with our current instrumentation. So it's important to be able to protect these for the future. Another really uh, typical um, feature, so just in the foreground here again, is that till veneer, um, you know, bedrock with a really thin layer of, of glacial material over the top where the ice sheet's been there in the past. And then this wide and sort of grey um, feature coming off the slope here is, um, we call them, we've officially called them, oh, I can never say it out loud, Niveo Aeolian deposits, nailed it. Um, locally, they're known as blizz tails. Um, so they, these form, it's snow, ice, grit, sand, gravel, and it forms, there's a really strong prevailing northeast wind, um, and these form in the lee of any kind of topographic high, whether it's a hill or a building on station, they can get quite spectacular during winter on station. These were difficult to map as a geologist because they change over human timescales. They can grow and recede um, between seasons, but they ended up being um, really interesting and I think quite significant um, part of this study. These features can be pretty huge. This is me standing at the base of one. Um, you can see all the um, grit on the top um, that's been left behind as it's melted out. You might be able to see layers of snow and ice there. Um, and this feature, it's hard to get the sense of scale um, coming forward, but it's probably you know, melted back at least 100 metres um, over the previous years. And I think one of the um, yeah, really interesting things about them is these, um, you can see Snowy standing on one here. Um, on the right um, is just this area um, cut through. You can see layers of grit built up and then solid ice um, underneath. And so as they start to melt out a bit, all the sand and gravel accumulates on the top and then insulates them. Um, and so that ice can persist for many years. And I think the reason that these, um, in this case, are really particularly important is comes down to this. And that's that water is the greatest constraint on biodiversity um, in Antarctica and, and where things can thrive. It's a really extreme environment and we don't necessarily think of it as biodiverse beyond uh, penguins and seals, but it really is. And it can be quite spectacular. Um, these stamps were just released last week by Australia Post. And they highlight lichens um, in East Antarctica. Mosses as well thrive in some areas. Um, they're great records of recent climate change um, and do fascinating things, you know, as um, to protect themselves from dehydration and from ultraviolet uh, radiation and things like that. And I think the data that we're gathering about these sufficient materials, um, I hope will help us better understand 
um, the distribution of these sorts of species um, and the conditions that they might um, thrive in. Another example of where um, mapping is, is helping support um, other studies and uh, future decision making is back here at Marine Plain. I have to be honest, it's not a lot to look at, um, you know, just standing there on the hill, but it's globally unique and very significant scientifically. And that's because in the 1980s, um, fossil dolphins or um, fossil relatives uh, were found here. Some species, some specimens were removed, um, but others still remain. There's nowhere else in the world that these species were found um, and they date back to over 4 million years ago. This area is now an Antarctic specially protected area. So all areas of Antarctica are afforded environmental protections, but some areas are given extra special treatment. You need a permit just to go in here or even to fly over it. But there were big questions around access. Um, and so this area has a management plan um, and tended to be recommended that people land um, at the huts just to the north um, in a helicopter land um, just near those huts and then walk in from the north to these areas like the fossil sites um, that were you know of interest and these dark brown two dark brown um, blobs are really that fragile dusty um, material um, that you saw us walking through earlier um, there was also possibly the option of landing on a debris free um, bedrock area but you know as you can see from what I've shown you so far with that till veneer there's debris everywhere um, and so it's really hard to sort of you know make a case for being able to land elsewhere um, potentially creating a fan um, you know so of damage certainly from the north by mapping the whole Vestfold Hills area and then comparing it to this location we're able to show that in these hatched areas um, these were these are typical, you know, it's typical glacial till deposits um, that we find everywhere else. They're actually not that vulnerable um, to damage. And so if you're able to land a helicopter on them, you know, walk over them, if that's going to reduce the distance that you might have to walk over something really fragile, then that's perfectly fine. Um, and so we've provided this information to the Antarctic Division. It's being used to inform changes to that management plan. We've known anecdotally for a long time that those areas are probably fine, but we just didn't have a really good evidence base to support that decision um, and support those choices and changes. And so now we've got a stronger evidence base to propose changes to that management plan through the Antarctic Treaty System um, that has to approve them. So it's mapping um, and at, you know looking at things at the regional scale. We also gathered information with some test sites. Um, these were set up closer to Davis, so well away from the specially protected area. And it was looking at how the environment changed um, and recovered from disturbance. So we measured a range of um, range of soil parameters, um, its bulk density, its acidity, um, its salinity, its composition. Um, but really, I think one of the interesting um, things we looked at was uh, its was using structure from motion um, to monitor change. It's a photogrammetry technique. It's really commonly used in the film and, um, and archaeology fields, in the film industry and archaeology. And basically, you're taking a lot of 2D photos of a 3D object, um, and then that can be rendered into a 3D structure uh, with processing software. These test sites were fairly small, only a few metres in size. Uh, we did them on a couple of different substrates and really we just had four lanes. So we had a control, um, one set of foot passes um, along there, 20 foot passes, and then walking back and forth 200 times. We took samples and photos immediately before, after, after a week, and then revisited after a year to see what had changed. So on the far left we have before, and then after, um, revisiting after a short period of time, and then after a year. And you can see you know, on those um, tracks for 20 and 200 foot passes that we're getting a bit of a, a colour change. Um, there is some change there, but after a year, it's, it's all but gone. Because these are um, 3D models um, based on a 3D point cloud, we can rotate it, visualise it in 3D, and also um, create digital elevation models. Um, we will just point out as well, these divots up the top are where we were taking samples from. And so they're pretty apparent after a week, but even after a year, just these 10 centimetre holes haven't been entirely filled in yet um, and are still sticking out. So we can create digital elevation models, um, which I think show even more than we could see um, with that visible imagery. 
And I'd point out, you know, that single foot pass, you can see our boot, boot prints really obviously. Um, and then how much, you know, after 200 foot passes, just how much things start to spread out um, and move as well. And then certainly after a year, um, all of that trace is all but gone. We can also compare um, these models and subtract them from each other. So this is all compared to the before state. So obviously immediately after there's going to be a fair bit of um, change and disturbance. You can see those, um, you know, you can see all of that um, disturbance that uh, 200 foot, pass, foot passes has created. After a week, there's been very little rehabilitation or, or change, which we could see before. And then after a year, you can see that there has been, you know, a reasonable amount of change um, and even some other material being brought in across that, that area. Um, and those small sample holes are still evident. Vehicles can leave long lasting traces too. Um, these were tracks um, by, a, by a lake um, that haven't been rehabilitated. Um, and it, we don't know for this one, we don't know exactly how old it is, um, but multiple years. Um, things have changed now and tracks like this tend to be rehabilitated a lot better. Um, but you can see, you know, it's um, really quite obvious there in the landscape. Even from the air, things um, can be quite apparent. Um, for a sense of scale of this drone image, um, Jody and I are standing right in the back corner there. Um, and you can see uh, tracks um, coming through. These are likely related to a fuel spill that happened about 10 years ago. There was a helicopter sling loading fuel that ran into strife and had to jettison its load. And part of the remediation efforts were to physically remove the worst contaminated soil. And so although that particular fuel spill site's been um, you know, rehabbed and there's no trace of it there now, the physical impacts um, and you know, outside of that immediately affected area still visible in the landscape today. It's just been left to recover. Um, and with these really rutted tracks, that's not a great outcome. I think studying something small like footprints is also a great starting point for understanding the effects of bigger impacts, not just vehicles, but you know, infrastructure um, scale things as well. There's a huge legacy of environmental impacts in Antarctica. One example, an Australian example is Wilkes Station. This was established by the US um, and then gifted to us um, in the 60s, uh, in the 50s, I think, and then abandoned. Um, and there are thousands of fuel drums here at the surface, many buried in ice. There's buildings that are deteriorating, um, piles and piles of rubbish from food to machinery. Um, and there are you know, huge efforts um, underway to look at how we can effectively clean this up. And it's by no means a small task. Um, but you know, as we could see with those vehicle tracks, there's the chemical component, biological component to contamination, but there's a the physical component as well. Um, and then also physical impacts that can happen while we're trying to fix something and, and rehabilitate something. And so I think this information that we're gathering about the physical environment, um, how it changes and how it might be impacted is really useful um, as a baseline, um, as well as being able to more effectively monitor change over time, not just immediately, but five, 10, 15 years down the track to more objectively assess our success with rehab efforts um, and inform future efforts as well and, and keep iterating on that um, and keep improving things. So where to next? Um, I think there's there's four gaps um, and areas that I think are sort of logical next steps. There's some science questions, um, you know, what soil properties make an area vulnerable? We tried to address that um, as part of this pilot study, but these glacial materials are super heterogeneous. There's all sorts of stuff in there. And I think in the scale that we we're looking at, we couldn't really um, detect a lot of, um, couldn't detect significant differences. Um, and so I think there's you know, some opportunities there to refine that so that we can predict things um, a bit more easily. Um, you know, if you have one area, say in the Vestfold Hills, one area further afield that have similar soil characteristics, we can make the inference that they might react um, in the same way. And identifying other landforms that are vulnerable, not just in this study area, but elsewhere as well. I think there's a lot of scope to look at um, to start applying this to other impacts. So legacy impacts, like I mentioned, um, our current practices, um, you know, and immediate changes that are happening in the near future and activities, um, as well as, you know, implementing these sorts of approaches into the planning stages of future activities, new stations, infrastructure, things like that. 
and that can give us the best chance of simply and effectively mitigating impacts and monitoring their success as well. The Vestfold Hills is, is one of many ice-free areas in Antarctica and East Antarctica has been a huge gap um, for years. There's been a lot of work on human impacts in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, thanks to the New Zealanders. Um, they have decades of experience in this space and we've learned a lot from them. Also the Antarctic Peninsula um, has seen a lot of this work as well. And I think that there's a lot of value in comparing and contrasting those areas. It's all Antarctica, but they're actually quite different environments. Um, and so I think there's valuable lessons we can learn um, and also maybe you know, our own techniques that we can um, and management techniques that we can employ as well. And there's also areas, um, other areas in East Antarctica that I think we can look at as well, like the Bunga Hills, um, which is has sort of sporadic presence, um, as well as the Larsman Hills, um, which has quite a permanent presence as well. And Something that we're starting to work on already um, is linking worlds, so linking this physical environment with the biota um, that, that live on it. So it's integrating the geology with the biology. Um, you know, when it comes to ecological models, an area like the Vestfold Hills might be just input as rock, which as a geologist breaks my heart, but it's not the fault of ecologists. That information just hasn't existed. Um, and so now we've got some of that information um, in spatial data sets ready to go. I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing how we can you know, untangle some of those relationships um, a bit further. And that's something that we're working on um, in the Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future um, ARC program. Before I finish up, there's a few acknowledgements that I'd like to make. Um, this work you know, has had unique um, and extraordinary input from a lot of people particularly Jodie Smith and Snowy Hablin, um, who I want to thank. They're the most tremendous scientists and people you could hope to have on your team. So um, thank you both so much uh, for your work and contributions. And there's also a whole host of people, institutions and groups um, that have helped make this work happen. Obviously, the Australian Antarctic Program, the Antarctic Division, science planning and operations teams and many more. Everyone at Davis Station um, when we were there. Collaborators from um, overseas um, and locally as well, um, groups, you know, all across GA and cartography, spatial um, GIS support and, and stratigraphy as well. And um, the amazing team in the in the GA labs, especially Stuart and David, who've um, helped make this happen. So I'll leave it there um, and happy to take on any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Steph. What a fantastic seminar during Earth Science Week. Um, I think it really described our amazing geoscience at play to support the Madrid Protocol and especially in ensuring adequate protection of our environment in Antarctica. So wonderful presentation. I'd like to open up for questions, actually. So if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat and we'll ask Steph to respond to them. The first one um, that has come through is just asking if the report um, has been finalised and, and whether we can share the link to that publication, Steph. So the map um, is released and um, I can definitely share um, the link to that. The other reports, we're still finalising those mm -hmm. um, and getting through the nitty gritty of some of that data, but that'll be coming out in the next few months and we'll promote that as well through GA social media channels. So keep an eye out there. That sounds great. Steph, I'm, I'm just kind of keeping an eye on the chat window here and I can't see any further questions. I've got a question of my own, if you don't mind. What was your most memorable experience in working on this project? I'm sure you have many. Penguins, maybe? <laughs> oh, so many memorable experiences. Um, oh, I think... Something I'll never forget is um, the first time we went down, Snowy and I were on the Aurora Australis icebreaker, um, which is an experience in and of itself. And a couple of days out from Davis is where we started breaking ice. Um, and, you know, it'd been getting colder, we'd started seeing icebergs, mm -hmm. but when the ship started to hit that fast ice and started breaking through the, the sound of steel hitting ice um, and sort of feeling like we were flying over it is just a sound and experience I'll never forget. It was unique um, and it's something I'll never forget. In terms of the work though, um, uh, yeah, it's just an extraordinary experience. And I think something I've learned, um, I went into it, you know, I was fairly new going into this. And when we were establishing this project, I was not far out of being a grad and I felt like I needed to know all the answers. 
Um, and I definitely didn't, but I felt like I had to know all the answers. Um, and, you know, something I was fortunate to learn, I think, at least eventually, was that I didn't need to know all the answers and, and having the right people around um, meant that, you know, I didn't need to know all that. And they made just such unique, um, awesome contributions um, that I couldn't have, you know, I never would have come to those ideas um, myself. So, yeah, that was a really um, good lesson to learn. Yeah, great collaboration. Yeah. So first question that's coming from Christopher just acknowledges a great presentation. Um, the question is, what does physical landscape re rehabilitation in Antarctica look like? What strategies are used? That's a great question. So it is very different to what we might expect on Mount Ainsley or, or Black Mountain. Um, so some examples might be, so those vehicle tracks that we saw, mm. um, it used to be that they were just left. Um, now what we would see is that you might get a digger in um, and start to move those bigger boulders and cobbles, you know, back to where they were and really kind of rake up that um, surface material mm -hmm. so that vis visually um, it kind of resembles um, what it might have before. But actually, if you can even just pile some of that a little bit high, you know, preventing that rutting from happening. Yeah. Um, on bigger projects, uh, you know, bigger things like um, station redevelopments and things, things like that, um, you know, each nation will have its own approaches. Something that we're seeing is almost um, not necessarily rehabilitation, but, you know, a very different um, approach now from stations being redeveloped is using existing footprints rather than mm. expanding out and actually reducing our physical footprint. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an awesome change that's, that's that's happened over the years. Informed by your work, no doubt. That's wonderful, Steph. Well, I can't take credit for all of that, um, but I think there's just increasing recognition um, yeah. in the world of the importance of um, being more considerate in our footprint there. Absolutely. Next question uh, comes from Gareth, uh, and it just notes that you showed lots of great DEMs, digital ele uh, elevation models. Could you please discuss the range of methods used to make them and the accuracy spatial coverage trade-offs? Um, so I presume they were quite high resolution DEMs, were they, Steph? Yeah, I assume um, Gareth is referring to those structure from motion yeah. elevation models that were created. So, yeah, they would have a spatial res resolution of a couple of millimetres. Um, they were geo-referenced to um, basically just a local datum um, and we had ground control points, um, little markers that were put in that we could um, relatively align them. We used um, the software we use is uh, Metashape, which is really common sort of industry standard um, uh, photogrammetry software, PIX4D is very similar um, and quite common. These models are pretty computationally intensive yeah. to make. Um, so, you know, I had a, a field laptop with, I think it's got 32 gig of RAM and we had hundreds of photos. And so some of these would literally take days, if not weeks, and it would just churn away, yeah. churn away, churn away. Um, so, yeah, with the um, drone imagery, um, again, we are putting that through Metashape. They were a lot easier to process because with a drone, you can quite nicely control, you know, it's overlap and it's quite steady, whereas the ground-based ones, I was just taking that with a digital camera. Um, but, you know, we've learned a lot of um, things about, you know, how we can effectively capture that um, imagery in the future. And, um, yeah, so I hope yeah. that, that gives you a um, bit of detail there. Yeah, definitely. And I guess the thing is that we could make high resolution DEMs over very large areas, but obviously the computation of that would be a factor that we'd need to take into account, Steph. Uh, next question, uh, fantastic talk and great work from Anthony. How useful is your background in surface regolith mapping in Australia? Yeah, so it was quite a transition to go from, you know, I did a lot of my research in regional and, mm. and remote Australia, um, quite ancient landscapes, um, whereas this area in Antarctica, depends how you talk about it, you know, the bedrock's billions of years old, but the, the glacial deposits are, you know, a few mm. thousand years old. Um, I think, and there was a lot of, you know, going to the basics of, you know, what do glaciers do? How do they work? Um, what are glacial deposits and how do they, you know, what do they look like in the environment? But I think that 
rigorous geology background um, really gave me a good grounding in reading landscapes um, and looking for you know, particular features um, that might point to certain geological processes um, and understanding the link between deep geological processes, deep time mm -hmm. um, and how that, that is manifested and shaped on the surface. So, yeah, I think it was a really good um, background to have for this. Yeah, absolutely. Next question is from Marita and she asks, any potential to look at seabed human impacts? Um, yes, definitely. So there's, um, GA has done some amazing um, detailed seabed mapping in Antarctica um, over the last decade or so mm -hmm. um, with plans to do more as well. And um, obviously that environment has a lot of glacial impacts and you can see icebergs, scours and things like that. Um, but one of the past practices for rubbish disposal was sea icing, where rubbish was put on sea ice and then kind of just waved off into the sunset. Um, and obviously that melts out and, and debris is left on the seafloor. And so there's, I think, a you know, huge potential for using seabed mapping, bathymetry mapping um, to look at those uh, human impacts as well. Absolutely. Well, it's, I'm glad to hear that that's no longer the case, Steph. <laughs> Next question comes from Sophie. Um, did you always want to work in Antarctica? In university, um, did you do anything to help make this a reality? I think Antarctica was somewhere that always fascinated me. Um, I don't, I'm not sure I sort of set my sights on it, but it was always something I had in my periphery as that would be really cool to do. Um, and so I think when it came to university, um, and career choices. It wasn't so much a deliberate choice to pursue Antarctic science, but having an openness to opportunities that presented themselves um, and the willingness to, to jump at it and say yes. I think the only reason I ended up in this job was back to a morning tea um, during my grad year when someone, previous grad had said, oh, I tried mm -hmm. to set up a, a rotation with the Antarctic team, but it didn't kind of work out. Do you want to see, you know, if it could work out for you this year? And I went, yeah, absolutely. Let's make that happen. Yeah. Um, and so I just had this three month rotation with the team and, and loved it. And I think we sort of got a sense that I had some skills that would be really useful. And then it was on the back of that, that we made the case for me to have a permanent placement in the team. And so I think having an eye, um, and a willingness to, to take those opportunities and run with them, um, is a big part of why I got here today. Yeah, a wonderful opportunity to explore and look where you are now. That's fantastic. Listen, I think just with timing, we've got time for maybe one more question and it comes from Patrick and he notes, whilst all disturbance would have an impact on Antarctica, I'd imagine arguably a single misplaced footprint would have just as much, high, uh, much impact as heavy foot traffic, e.g., high prevailing winds impacting the edges of a deep footprint. Can you pre please briefly expand on this, Steph? Yeah, so I think that comes back to this idea that even though at the surface a lot of this environment looks the same, mm. there are differences yeah. um, in it, and that comes back to the geological processes that form that environment. So there's fragile marine deposits at marine plain versus something left behind uh, by a glacier have very different properties. Um, and so um, through either um, anecdotally, you know, like in this case, we had to we had to go through marine plane and, mm -hmm. and leave this um, disturbance behind to check on these fossil sites that we were interested in, mm -hmm. um, looking at the status of those. Um, so looking at, at that and the effect that um, that, that has versus, um, you know, elsewhere where we can perhaps you know, put in some test sites. Um, mm -hmm. It's not well, not perfectly comparable, um, but we do the best we can. And um, yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to winds and um, the edges of a deep footprint, um, you know, there's there's other factors at play. You know, what's the soil, uh, the moisture content, is there snow around, um, things like that. So there's a whole range of factors at play. Um, but, you know, I think now we can start to pick apart, um, you know, some of, those, some of those variables. So I hope that answers your question, Patrick. It does. I've got, actually, I might just extend it. Maybe we do have time for just one more question. Sure. Um, next question is, how far is the research location to Lake Vostok? Covered with ice for millennia, cut off from light and contact with the atmosphere, Lake Vostok is one of the most extreme environments on Earth. So just a question around how far the research location is to 
Lake Vostok. I wouldn't be able to give you um, numbers other than a long way, um, you know, hundreds if not thousands of kilometres away from Lake Vostok, which is um, covered by ice, obviously, um, and much more central to Antarctica. We we're really on the edges here. Um, it's interesting, though, um, you know, these lakes that I alluded to in the Vestfold Hills, some of them are fascinating. There's one called Deep Lake. It's the deepest accessible part of Antarctica. Its surface sits 50 metres below sea level, um, and its salinity is something like mm. 8 to 10 times um, that of seawater. It doesn't freeze in winter, even though it gets to minus 40 degrees. Um, so different environments, different parts of Antarctica, but still really interesting um, stories about lakes and, and life. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, Hain uh, says, thanks for the talk, Steph. Looking forward to the next 10 years, what are you most excited about? It's a great question. Um, uh, I think something that I'm really excited about is seeing this, um, the information that we're collecting and understanding about these environments, um, like in that final slide, looking at how it interacts with other parts of the Antarctic environment. Um, we, there's a lot of effort that goes into understanding biodiversity mm. and its vulnerability. And I think um, we're just getting started um, in a lot of these areas when it comes to understanding human impacts, but also understanding the interactions um, between that environment and, and biology as well. And I'm really excited to see where we take that. Yeah, the geology biology link. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, one more question. Funding for Antarctica is from the goodwill of governments. What options are there for self-funding Antarctica research, such as tourism, fishing, mining, etc.? Yeah, so um, I can't speak um, in a lot of detail about the specifics of this, but in Australia we do have the Antarctic Science Foundation, um, which was set up in the last couple of years mm -hmm. um, and supports scientific research in Antarctica, so definitely go and check them out. Um, and I know that in um, particularly on the peninsula, so closer to South America, um, there are some tourism vessels that also support scientists going on board. I think that's a great way for tourists to understand the kind of science that happens in Antarctica and, and, science to make, and scientists to make the, the most of opportunities that they have to get into field work. Yeah. Well, excellent presentation, Steph. That kind of rounds out the questions that we've had from our virtual audience. Um, I just want to recognise uh, what is fascinating and really important work in terms of understanding the impact of humans on the environment in uh, in Antarctica and obviously all of the good work and the next next, step, next steps that you outlined. So thank you for a really informative and insightful presentation uh, today, Steph, much appreciated. Thanks. Um, two seminars previously scheduled for this month um, has been, have been postponed until 2022 at the request of the presenters. So our next Wednesday seminar will be a distinguished GA lecturer presentation on the 3rd of November by a team from our National Location Information Branch. And just to give you a sense of what they'll be covering, through Commonwealth and State and Territory Government Partnerships, the National Location Information Branch at GA implements cutting edge approaches to integrate and deliver data, services, and analytical capability to the public, government, and critical industries. This DGAL will present examples of NLI's work central to, a, to the Australian government's ambitious digital economy strategy to make Australia a leading global economy by 2030, along with the Australian data strategy to ensure government data is in the best state to feed this future digital economy. So please join us again on the 3rd of November uh, when our NLI colleagues will be presenting to you. Have a wonderful day. Uh, take care and stay well.